So we're finished our discussion about deformation in depleting reservoirs. And you know, previously we talked about changes in porosity. Well, of course, if you're, if you're squeezing out the porosity of the material, the material is going to shrink. And if that material is in the ground, right, you're going to get subsidence. And so this is a picture, one of my favorite pictures of subsidence, but this has nothing to do with petroleum reservoirs. Anybody know what that is? These are subsidence craters at the Nevada test site, which is north of Las Vegas in, in Nevada. Anybody know where those are from? So those pock marks, right? These are big depressions in the earth. Yeah, nuclear explosions. So, um, so you know, the Nevada test site's a massive tunnel complex uh, under the ground. Is you know deep down. Uh, there's you know, up to like miles deep. There's tunnels uh, where they used to up until 1992, when they when they called a moratorium on nuclear testing. They used to test underground nuclear weapons. And so they would uh, set off a nuclear explosion, create a huge cavity in the earth, compact all that material, but then eventually that you know, the cavity that they would create, would, the material would begin to fall down from the ceiling. And uh, you know, so in that sense, it's not exactly the same with depletion in a petroleum reservoir. But what they're essentially there, they're, they're moving all the material out, out to the exterior, and then it's falling in on the top. But it's the same idea. It's compacting, you know, in the sense that you're, you're, you're compressing the porosity out of the material. And then this you know, causes these massive subsidence craters. And this is a tiny picture. Um, if, you, if you were to, say, zoom out from a satellite view, uh, there are thousands and thousands of these in north, north of Las Vegas. And so it's, it's kind of crazy how much nuclear testing we get. But Anyway, I, I like this picture because it, it, it's sort of the extreme example of what can happen uh, due to subsidence. So, you know, nowadays we'll, we'll mostly use fully coupled geomechanical simulators, finite element models, and other things to model subsidence. But you can do a certain amount with back of the envelope sort of hand calculations. And um, so there's a, this guy, he's a pretty famous mechanician, Geertzma. He's done quite a work in mechanics, quite a bit of work in mechanics. Uh, he, in 73, published a paper where he developed a solution for the expected surface displacements for uh, a cylindrical, uh, basically that would occur um, from changing H underneath a cylindrical reservoir, if you will, right, or a cylindrical cavity in this case, right? And so R is the distance at the surface. The little r is the distance at the surface. Big R is the radius of this disk. Uh, H is the height of the disk. D is the depth at which the disk is, is at. And so this, is, this, is, this R is at the surface of the Earth. And then so here's your uh, solutions in terms of R and D and a change in pore pressure. And then this CM, CM is sort of the compaction. It's a, a sort of material constant, if you will. It's a, it's a, it's a constant that relates, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of deformation to the change in pore pressure. Okay. And uh, so, you know, this would be functions of R and H, but H here, I'm sorry, R and D, but D here is evaluated at zero. So this is, these are the surface displacements as a function of R, in the in the in the radial direction and in the so in the radial direction and in the z direction. Okay. And so uh, the solution of these guys is actually quite complicated. Uh, it, it involves like the integration of Bessel functions and elliptic integrals and other things. Um, but ultimately, uh, you can if you if you choose the parameters. Uh, rho and eta, where rho is the sort of ratio of the surface distance versus the radius of the disk. Uh, so these are dimensionless parameters. Uh, and d is the ratio of the depth uh, versus the width, uh, the depth of the reservoir versus the width of the reservoir. Uh, then, and then you just normalize the equations by delta h. And there's a reason for doing that. In a second, we'll see. 
uh, then they simplify into these two salute, these two equations, where A and B are these two guys. Um, F0, let's see. F0 is an elliptic integral of the first kind. E0 is an elliptic integral of the second kind, which, by the way, you can get from MATLAB with the function um, ellip k e it takes an argument m so in other words this this function will return f and e all at once in one evaluation of the function So if you provide it M, it'll return both of those guys in MATLAB. Um, lambda is um, humans. Lambda function. Why do you think I made it a point to tell you what the function of MATLAB was? You're going to solve a problem. So I've given you that idea. There, there is not an implementation of humans' lambda function in MATLAB, so you have to write your own, okay, when you, when you go to work this problem, the problem I will assign. And I'm actually not going to tell you what it is, at least not right now. I may give you a hint later. But, you know, I'm trying to make you guys be better coders and go more, more comfortable going to the computer. And uh, th quite frankly, these days, being a good coder is using Google. I would not be near as good a programmer as I am if it weren't, weren't for Google. I'd be one-tenth as good because I can't remember, and especially I use a language like C++, which is so massive that no one knows all of it. You have to go to Google, right? And so in this case, you have to go to Google to figure out what the hell a human's lambda function even is. And and then you have to figure out how to implement it in that. Okay. It's not that hard. It's it's this it's four or five lines. Right. So obviously, you know, this is a perfect example. I mean, in a way, this is nothing more than an exercise. The solution is there. I mean, so this is in a way just a calculator exercise. It's just a calculator, the calculations involved are quite complicated because your, your calculator probably doesn't have implementations of elliptic integrals in it. So, but other than that, I mean, there's no for looping or anything like that. It's just a, it's, it's put in the numbers and get some outputs, right? So it's a calculator exercise. All right. So then, So with those solutions, these type of plots uh, were created. Now this is for a generic sort of family of reservoirs. So this this DOR parameter is varied from 0.2 to 3, and then here's your horizontal displacement normalized by your change in uh, normalized by the change in height of the reservoir uh, as a function of the, <coughs> as a function of the normalized radius there. And so this is the, the vertical displacement, which, of course, you can see is a maximum at the center of the reservoir. And this is the horizontal displacement, UR. This is the horizontal displacement, which you can see is a maximum when the ratio R over R is 1, which is where? In relationship to that disk, where is it? R is the radius of the disk, and big R is the radius of the disk, and little r is the radius along the surface in space, right? So when they're one, 
is at the edge, right? So the, his, so the horizontal displacement would be a maximum at the edge, and of course the vertical displacement would be a maximum in the center. Uh, I guess I didn't mention, the, re the reason that it's, it's useful to look, look at this as a function of, of, a, of a change in delta, in other words, if you go back to these equations, you could multiply that del delta H out. So you could, you could move this delta H to the other side, and then, then the solution for the displacement is just A times delta H, right? Well, delta H, that's the change in height of the reservoir. Well, we can relate the change in height of the reservoir, or we can estimate it as a function of, or, uh, well, let's just write, in one dimension, the change in porosity in the reservoir would be the change in height over the original height, right? In sort of a sort of a strain measurement. So so you could solve this equation then for for you know delta H it would be change in porosity times H. Okay. Well, remember what we talked about last time? The ways of computing change of porosity as a function of depletion. Right? You combine it with a cap model and, uh, and put it all in reservoir space and all this. Right? So this gives you a way. I mean, it's a fairly complicated way, but it's still sort of analytic or quasi-analytic solutions. It's not like a full finite element. You can do these very fast, sort of back-of-the-envelope calculations where you could you know, compute what the what the expected change in porosity is due to depletion, and then plug it into this model to see what the expected subsidence is. So, uh, you know, by the way, uh, if you look at these and you just uh, or go back to the equations and just plug in some numbers. So if we had um, a change in porosity of about 3%, oops. which if you go back to last time when we looked at that Gulf of Mexico field X, We looked at it, that was re so this is a reasonable number. Last time we looked at a case study for that Gulf of Mexico field X, and there was a change in porosity of about three percent. Right, so it's a it's a real number. It's not it's not out of the ordinary. Well, if you were to look at a reservoir that was uh, about three hundred meters in height, and um, had a delta H of 9 meters and, and a D over R 0 0.2, then the subsidence at the surface, UZ, would be on the order of 9 meters. 9 meters. And, I'm sorry, 7 meters. 7 meters. If you plug in those numbers, it would be on the order of 7 meters. And there, there's a field in California, the Wilmington field, it actually saw nine meters of subsidence. So, I mean, these numbers, they, they, nine meters seems like a lot to me, right? Just deplete the reservoir and the Earth's going to drop nine meters? Boom. Three stories, right? It's the third story of this building. That's a lot, right? So in that Wilmington field, they actually had to do something. Uh, they had to come in and inject water to replace the, the lost fluids to stop the subsidence from occurring. I promise you, if your house was on top of this reservoir, nine meters would be a lot. 
<laughs> your entire slab would be cracked or into a bunch of pieces. Um, so, you know, then the question is, what what can you do with this model? It's fairly simplistic, you know. Of course, I mean, it's fairly idealized, right? Re reservoirs aren't perfect disks and perfectly homogeneous. But uh, Zoback presents a, a couple of case studies. We'll look at one here. Um, oops. So this is a Leeville field in Louisiana. Um, so there's a sort of cutout. This is where we are in Louisiana. Right? New Orleans is right here. Everybody been to New Orleans? Yes, no. Everybody been to New Orleans? You haven't been to New Orleans? You should go. It's my, it's my favorite city, I think. I love the food there, it's the culture. It's a fun city. Uh, so, Leeville is here, uh, and uh, and so then you know from a, from sort of reference stations that are off uh, of the reservoir. So that in, in terms of the distance from some reference station here, this is a distance away. The Leeville field is in this gray shaded area, and and these are surface measurements. Okay, so you see, uh, you know, at the reference station, there's no subsidence and then as we move close so even off of the even away from the reservoir there's some subsidence but of course over centered over it then you have a lot of subsidence so these these are real measurements with air bars okay real measurements th th this is in centimeters right. and uh, and this is a model this dash line is a model prediction okay now what they did here was they didn't just use a single disk they used like a principle of superposition and essentially superimposed a bunch of these Gerstner, Gerstner calculations uh, to come up with this. And that's why you don't, it's not like a perfectly symmetric, it doesn't look like the curves on other other plot because it's, uh, you know, they, they use a superposition type model to come up with this. But you can see, at least for this case, it's it's fairly fairly accurate. I mean, it's, a, it's within the, the error bars of the, of the model. And in, in this case, it was like, 10 centimeters. I think he also shows another case for this field in Louisiana. I'm not. I don't have any slides on it, but if you want to look in the book, uh, it's just one of the last pages of the book before the references. They, they talk about this field, and I didn't want to put it on there because I can't even say the name. It's one of those French names, Lanyap or something. <laughs> but this field here had a subsidence on the order of like 15 centimeters in some areas. And the model uh, in one in the center of the reservoir, the model predicted quite well uh, the subsidence. But then on one one edge, where there was some known faulting occurring, uh, the real subsidence was much much more than what the model was predicting. Because remember, the model doesn't account. You know, it's just changing pore pressure. It's not accounting for any uh, faulting that might be occurring and slipping around faults. So that. That's why if you need a really accurate model, you'd, you'd want to use a full sort of finite element simulation with, that, you know, you have all the details of faulting and you know, plasticity model and everything like that. So I said it'd be 20 minutes. I, I made it, I went 22 minutes, I guess. <laughs>